Hello everyone, my name is Michael SK, and welcome to Chapter 8 of Higurashi When They Cry. This is the final chapter of the main eight chapters, and then it goes into other directions and like a whole new series and a whole bunch of other stuff. I, I don't know where everything goes from here, but I can at least say that of the main plot of the main original story of Higurashi When They Cry, this is the final chapter. Which is crazy, because uh, in case you guys haven't been here with me since the beginning of my Higurashi ride, I started this off as like a spooky Halloween thing like two years ago, so 2020. It's not really scary, but I think the... Uh, honestly, you know what? I'm going to blame the anime. Promotional videos and stuff that I heard about the anime made it seem scarier than it actually was. I, I had never watched it, and, and the reasoning was because I thought it was some sort of horror anime or a scary series altogether. And it's really not. It, it really isn't. The mystery is what's really alluring with this. I would say that Chapter 1 does have a little bit of uh, spooky elements because we have no idea what's going on through Keiichi's wacky ass perspective. But enough of that. That's not important. What is important is it has been a wild ride getting up to this point. I am surprised that I made it to this point. I'm really happy I stuck with it because I wasn't really wanting to jump into a long series whenever I um, started chapter one, but then I stuck with it. And it became a long series, so so much for that. But it it has been really good. It, it, this has been a really fun time here on the channel, and I'm excited to finally meet the end of it all. Now, I said this before, but I'm assuming that this chapter will wrap everything up. We will learn about Takano, and I kind of say that because we saw a younger, or I saw a younger version of her in the Steam title card. So that kind of gave that away. They kind of spoiled, you know, that there's some importance to Takano as well uh, before I found out that she was the main antagonist. And I'm assuming, hopefully, that Rika and Hanyu go through yet again to try and succeed, to, to actually defeat fate and move on. I don't know how they're going to, but that is at least my hope. So those are my predictions for this chapter there is a lot that I could say, because there's a lot that has happened throughout these chapters, but I don't want to sit here for 10 minutes and ramble on about all that, so we'll we'll jump in. I don't know if the sound effects are at the right volume. I'm going to assume they are, and that this, uh, this lovely uh, cicada effect that we are getting right now is just really loud. Maybe it's always been loud, I don't know. All right. So this is Matsuri Bayashi. At least let it end with a blissful dream. It is the festival accompanying chapter. I have no idea what that means. I mean, last time it was, uh, what was it? it? It was really straightforward as to what it was. It, it was, I, I can't even remember. And I said it like a week ago. Wow. The riddle you have been entrusted with solving now finally becomes unraveled. What's, what must be done to stop the chain? What will happen in the ultimate end? It's a showdown between the conclusion you reached and the one I reached. There is no difficulty. You should understand that now. Yeah, I kind of understand how everything is laid out. I don't even know if I was successful in guessing some of these things, but it, it was fun trying to solve the mystery. I guess the mystery now is, how does everybody live? Yeah, thanks for laughing. I don't understand that either. That sound effect is like totally out of place in my opinion. Everyone is entitled to happiness. The difficult part is accepting that. Everyone is entitled to happiness. The difficult part is fulfilling that. I am too entitled to happiness. The difficult part is working out a compromise. I fucked up the, the two and the am there. Okay, so that name, this is a work of fiction. Okay, yeah, so that name, I'm pretty sure, and I, and, and I could be wrong, is a name somewhere else in the series, just not Higurashi. It's the, uh, it's the other series. The study was filled with piles of books and papers. 
In that study, there was a full-figured old man writing something at his desk in utmost concentration. There was also a little girl sorting out papers on the carpet. She almost looked as though she was playing with them, but the serious expression she was wearing made it clear that she wasn't. Miyoko. Hifumi, alright. Okay, so I think they fucked with the volume in this chapter because this is a lot quieter on the character voices. I think. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think at least these two are being a lot quieter. I don't know, did I mess with the settings last time? I don't remember. Voice volume. I mean, we could, I guess, set it back to the middle and see how that is. Soda. Hmm. So are the parasites the cause of the spread of ideology? When ideologies clash, is that because different parasites are competing to expand their uh, habitat? あれ その中には宿主の体内に潜伏して共存し、時には宿主を支配したりすることが広く知られている。そして実際に人体内にその存在をたくさん発見してもいる。にもかかわらず、人体に潜伏し、その宿主を支配する生命体の存在については固くなに否定
思想は治療不可能な伝染病と置き換えられるわけだ。So you mean anyone with a different idea is treated like they have a disease? そういうことだ。この考えを延長すると、無差別、そして無秩序な大量虐殺が起こる。そうすると、人類は大規模な粛清を肯定してしまう論調になりかね。だから。脳内で宿主を支配する生命体を語ることは今の時代ではタブーになっているのだタブーって触れてはならない考えてもならないということだなだから誰も研究せんいやそれどころか脳内に侵入し影響を及ぼす存在がいると考えることすら忘れられている。万物の超たる霊長類を支配する未知の生命体などいるはずがないと頭から決めつけている<笑>なんだかお粗末な話 Is it though? いないことの証明なんて悪魔の証明絶対に不可能なのにその通り悪魔がいることを証明することはたやすい悪魔を連れてくればいいのだからなだがいないことを証明することはできんいないを連れてくることなどできんのだからな<笑>なんだか脳を支配する生命体が自分たちの存在を秘密にするためにその宿主の人間たちを操っているみたい Isn't that usually how parasites exist in the first place? I, I don't really know too many things about parasites so I'm, I'm honestly asking a, a real question here. I, I really did, just have no idea. Especially those with an, uh, like, that actually attach to your brain and change your thoughts, you know? That's a, that's a real thinker right there. Me and my grandfather shared a happy laugh together. Hell yeah. それをもって深刻化された存在であると思い込むなど愚かしいことなのだ。人とてあらゆる微生物やウイルスに支配されうるのだ。その存在が今日まで発見されていないからといって、それをもって存在しないという証拠にはならん。絶対に存在する。必ず存在するのだ。科学の世界にもたくさん存在が仮定されていてそうだそれらの仮定をした科学者が全て生きているうちに評価を受けられたわけではない読まいごとだと呆れられその正しさを証明できなかった科学者も大勢いたのだでもおじいちゃんは生きているうちに証明されるといいねじゃなかったらおじいちゃんがかわいそう大丈夫だよ神様は努力するものを見捨てたりはしない。努力は必ずいつか結実するのだ。いつかってそれはいつ神がいつ降臨されるのかは誰も知らない。それは例えるなら泥棒がいつ訪れるのかわからないように。だから予期せずしてその時を迎えて不信心であったことに歯ぎしりすることがないよう。常に目を覚ましていなさい。That was something that my, grand, my grandfather said all the time, excuse me. Nobody knows when efforts will bear fruit, but it will happen one day. And that's why you must always work hard so you have no regrets when the time comes. Your efforts will bear fruit someday. And that's what he meant. でも、おじいちゃんが生きているうちに絶対に努力が実る生きてるうちに認められなかった科学者がたくさんいるのに That was such a cruel thing to say, but I didn't mean to be cruel. I had seen how hard my grandfather had been working, and I also knew he wouldn't live forever. I just wanted his work to gain recognition before he died. That's fair. Do you know of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yeah. He was crucified and resurrected after three days. You told me about it. How do you think Jesus was resurrected? Didn't he just get up as if he was waking up in the morning? He was buried after his execution, so his body was in the ground. Did he break open the tombstone and claw out like a zombie? Ha ha ha. No, no. 
That wouldn't be called a resurrection. The sinners who kill Jesus imagine exactly the same thing. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm, I'm an atheist, and I never really looked into Christianity or a lot of, you know, similar religions or religions in general. So I, um, I have no idea how the saying goes. Jesus predicted just before he was executed that he would come back to life after three days. The sinners buried Jesus, sealed his tomb, and posted guards to watch over it. But what Jesus meant wasn't that he would resurrect physically. He meant his teachings would be resurrected. After three days, Jesus' teachings were resurrected and people regained their belief. The hearts of those who wanted to be shown the proper way revived his teachings. And that's what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. He came back to life in the hearts of his believers. Jesus doesn't exist physically on this earth, but he exists in people's hearts. In other words, that's when Jesus became an existence superior to humans. Ah, alright, I see, I see where things are kind of going there. I don't know if it was Higurashi or something else. I, I want to say it was something else that I played here on the channel. Talking about where uh, you, you want people to remember you. If no one knows you, you don't exist physically, or I guess in this case, in people's hearts. You, you just flat out do not exist. You need somebody to know you. Even if it's after the author's death. <laughs> その時私の研究はいつか必ず認められる。その時おじいちゃんは神様になれるということなんだよ。オッケー、スターティングサウンドアルフェミリアヒア。その時が訪れるのが私が生きているうちなのかそうでないのかそれは神様にもわからないだがその日は必ず訪れるだからその日の訪れを疑うことなくひたすらに努力を続けなくてはならないのだよ。It was very sad to hear my grandfather say that his life would end one day. He wasn't ill and he didn't only have a few years left to live, but set next to the average lifespan, his remaining years didn't look like much. The only person left in my life was my grandfather, so I didn't even want to consider that it would be like, or just consider what it would be like with him gone, excuse me. Grandfather must have remembered that I didn't like to talk about that subject. With a tender smile, he gently patted my head. <laughs> I purposely didn't mean the before you die part. I caught myself before I said it. Grandfather smiled in satisfaction. His research wasn't exactly outrageous. He wasn't trying to uncover the mysteries of the universe. He was only searching for the possibility that parasites could be responsible for human behavior, and nothing more than that. Nothing outrageous. It really wasn't a wild idea. We even had some leads. Hinamizawa Village, Shishibone City, whatever prefecture. The villagers there are possessed by a powerful homesickness. When they are unable to return, they allegedly behave abnormally as if they are cursed. There are also some bizarre rules in place in the village based on their belief system. When he was working with the military during the war, my grandfather noticed similarities between the people in Hinamizawa and assumed that some kind of existence was responsible for their odd behavior. He'd been researching it ever since. In the middle of the 20th century, numerous strange diseases were discovered all over Japan. Most of them were caused by infectious parasites and people started to pay attention to this forgotten field of study. Grandfather's research was simply one of those investigations into such diseases. Therefore, he believed it would be published amongst other research and attain recognition soon. But if, if his research didn't bear fruit before his death, I wanted to continue it. 
I wanted to continue his research. Grandfather taught me, resurrection isn't something that happens physically. It's when your life's work is appreciated. That's what he meant by resurrection. That's when he'll, be, that's when he'll become a god. So when my grandfather dies, he'll still be with me forever. I wouldn't have to be alone ever again. I will always be with my grandpa. Our works will gain recognition and we will both become gods, gaining eternal peace. I will make my grandfather into a god. I will become a god. Therefore, we will be granted eternity. We'll be together forever and ever. Well, it's, uh, it's kind of coming together here, isn't it? Kinda, maybe? All right, getting right into the into the freaky stuff. Yeah, I think the sound mixing in this is like totally different. Oh man, I don't even know like what. Is that a sound effect? No, that's not a sound effect. That's a music volume. Are you serious? That is so much louder than I'm used to it being. Is that just me? I don't know. The sound mixing definitely seems different. I'll have to see what it's like for uh, the voice volume as we hear more people, but I might have to make some adjustments for this one. I've been like relying off of the chapter five settings since you know the layout was a little bit different. And then chapters one through four, I was kind of relying on chapter one settings, but now everything's just so messed up. I was looking at the key on a keychain. The key was labeled Hen House, but the lock Erico was trying to open didn't belong to that door. It should have opened effortlessly. At least that's what was supposed to happen. But it didn't open. I noticed beads of sweat forming on Eriko's forehead. She was the one who came up with this idea. Eriko was starting to panic. The rest of us started to panic too. Okay, so... Uh, another thing I'm noticing is that sometimes they're not talking. This only opens the hen house. Let's stop. Let's go back. Shush. We were supposed to be cleaning out the hen house. If they found us back here, if they found out why we were here and why we were trying to open up the lock to the back door, then all four of us were sure to be sentenced to splayed piggy? Excuse me? Don't panic, Erico. That key opens this lock, right? You already tried it, right? Will you shut up for a minute? This is the right key. It's just hard to open, that's all. She was almost shrieking. Our hearts were pounding loudly. It was as though the sound of our heartbeats was echoing throughout the hallway. And at that point, we heard footsteps that didn't belong to a child. Shush! Somebody's coming. The three of us held our breath, but Eriko didn't hear it. She kept fussing with the lock and the key, as if everything would be okay if she could, if she could just open the lock. Eriko, somebody is coming. Be quiet. I know this is the right key. I'm not dreaming. I already tried it. They're tried and, and it opened. Come on, why isn't this working? When this lock is open, we can be happy and we can say goodbye to this hell. Erico, someone's coming. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think sound effects and everything is a little bit louder than I'm used to. Again, I could be wrong. My father and mother died. I don't know exactly how old they were. I was too young to remember. They went shopping without me, and that must be why they were punished. It was a train accident. What a terrible disaster. A lot of people died in that incident. But maybe my father was one of the lucky ones. He was still alive when he arrived at the hospital, so he was able to share his final words with me. My mother died instantly. I didn't want to admit that this person I could hardly recognize was my father. As I called out to him, I hoped that it was someone else instead. But, unfortunately, it was my father. Maybe I shouldn't have woken him, because when I woken him up, he was reminded of the miserable agony that he had forgotten. <laughs> He tried to move his right arm, so he could pat my head, but his arm was wrapped in bandages and his hand was no longer there? I couldn't find his hand anywhere on the bed. 
I, o I only had scary memories of his right hand. Its main job was to slap me when I did something bad, but I never wished it to be gone. Besides, that hand had also patted my head, even though that only happened a few times. It was a big, warm hand, and it stroked my head very gently. But no matter what good deeds I did, he could no longer rub my head. No, his hand was the least of my worries. He had to go into emergency surgery. The doctors already warned me that the chance of him surviving was very low. That was why I was allowed to see him regardless of his condition. Not only could he no longer rub my head, he might be gone forever. よく聞きなさい。お父さん。ダメかもしれない。もしもお父さんが死んだら、お前はしっかり生きるんだよ。嫌だ嫌だ。お父さんは元気になるよ。お医者様がちゃんと手術してくれるもん。だから死んだりな
How many children in this world can actually express their gratitude towards their parents in the first place? Children are supposed to be nurtured by their parents' love. Therefore, when that environment is destroyed, their hearts are wounded. Every child has his or her own personality. Receiving affection doesn't guarantee that a child will become someone angelic. Not everyone's heart can be healed. And that was why there were some problem kids at the orphanage. Maybe I shouldn't call them problem kids, though. The sadness and despair of losing their parents, and their anger at having to hide such feelings, filled those kids' hearts. Spending time individually with the children could have solved their problems, but at the orphanage where I was, none of the staff members even tried to spend time with them or put in an effort to understand them. All they could do was make sure that the kids followed the rules. Therefore, they could only see the children's emotions or emotional pleas for help as problems. In this world, nobody expresses love without expecting something in return. The person who founded that orphanage was expecting something in return as well. He wanted the children to appreciate him. That was why such a faint dream was destroyed by cruel reality. The children called the orphanage a prison, and nobody appreciated the staff at all. In fact, all they did was complain. That made the staff slowly realize that love alone couldn't run a facility like that. Just like how the children called it a prison, the staff started to recognize the facility as a prison too. It was a chain reaction results resulting from mistrust on both sides. The staff bound the children with, with rules so they could suppress problem behavior. There was a framed picture on the founder or of the founder of this orphanage, but I had never seen him in person. Was he satisfied with the fact that he put his own money into this social service? Or maybe he finally realized his dream of being surrounded by angelic children and being celebrated for what he did was simply that, a dream. I don't know. But there's one thing I'm certain of. Such a dream didn't exist at the orphanage. There were so many rules and several plausible standards outlined for us, but the most valued one was silence. Children's chatter tends to increase each other's volume, like the mics drawing closer, and sometimes that leads to fights and the disturbance of order. So children were forbidden from speaking with each other. With those disallowed, they must have thought things would go smoothly. However, I think I always heard people's voices at the orphanage. There were two kinds of voices. One was the staff yelling, and the other was the children crying. We were not allowed to walk around inside of the orphanage freely, so we never knew who it was that was crying. One time, along with the crying and yelling, we heard the noise of metallic things being smashed against each other. We knew it was some kind of punishment, but there was no way for us to even imagine what it was. We trembled, pretended we didn't hear anything, and kept working on our assignments. One of my roommates told me it was the casket punishment. But she didn't tell me any further, and I didn't want to know either. I kind of want to know. I'm curious. Even if we behaved exactly the same way as yesterday, if the staff were in a bad mood, they might pick on us. So even if I didn't want to know, I might suddenly find out what the casket punishment is one day. The footsteps of a staff member were getting closer. We noticed them, so we straightened our backs and pretended we were studying hard. It was more important that the staff saw us doing... Uh, saw us doing so than us actually getting work done. I noticed the girl next to me was falling asleep, so I poked her with my elbow. She noticed my signal and straightened her back like the other children. It was almost evening. This was the hardest time for us to keep ourselves awake, and the most dangerous time. Oh, Jesus. The door to our room opened. That's the door to our room? That... that... Okay, that, I guess that's a... Okay, yeah, this is sounding like a prison for sure. And a mean looking man showed up. And then he looked around to make sure none of us were falling asleep. Even if we were actually studying hard, if he thought we were asleep, we were out. And that was why he had to make sure we appeared to be studying very hard. The man walked around our desks. I hoped he would just walk by me. That was all we prayed for. Or that was what we all prayed, excuse me as we kept working on our homework. <clears throat> the more we pretended to study hard, 
the more we could hear the sound of metal objects. The sound of metal objects clashing into each other, along with screams. We couldn't even imagine what the poor subject of that punishment was going through. Maybe there was something even worse than the casket punishment. To erase such fears, we tried to concentrate even harder on our own work. We kept working, as the metal sounds and the screams went on forever. Jesus Christ. Well, this is fucking awful. I have no idea what words I could use to describe the situation. It's fucked up, that's for sure. Ah, uh, alright, the only time we were allowed to exchange words with our roommates was right after turning the lights off to go to bed. Being located in the middle of the mountains, the orphanage was very quiet at night. Damn, you know, I didn't think uh, Shion's school situation was all that great, but this is fucking worse. After making sure the staff members were far enough from our room, we enjoyed talking amongst ourselves. Oh, excuse me. That was the only leisure time allowed to us. Though it wasn't anything nice like enjoying pleasant conversation. Why? Because we mostly talked about others behind their backs. We spoke of things like that member of staff is only strict or unfair or malicious towards this person and so on. We just repeated those topics forever until someone couldn't keep themselves awake anymore. We even discussed how we could get back at the staff and we took revenge on all of them in our imagination. Some kids even started to cry when talking about it difficult as it was for us. Although the subjects we spoke of were negative, talking about them was the only way to vent our frustration. And even though we felt despair about tomorrow, we were able to fall asleep. But sometimes a different subject popped up. It was about the, what the fuck? The Yuri Gaoka House of Love and Mercy on the other side of the river. Yeah. Over there, I hear they got not only nap time, but snack time, too. Plus, their president is a very nice person. How does, like, a rumor such as that get here? The House of Love and Mercy was a privately run orphanage, just like the one I was at. But it was a very kind facility unlike ours. It seemed like a fantasy land compared to our current environment. A few years before, when this place was a lot worse, a few children tried to escape. It was hard to believe. There was a time when this orphanage was even worse to live at. Supposedly three or four people tried to escape. I don't know the exact number though. They headed to the House of Love and Mercy. Their escape was a success, except for one unlucky child. They were able to get to the property of the House of Love and Mercy. I guess the staff couldn't follow them into the other orphanage's property. In other words, the other facility's property had to be out of their jurisdiction. The staff were frustrated that kids got away from them, and they dragged the one they caught back here. I'm sure they wanted to bring back the others who got away from them too, and I'm certain the staff were determined not to let a single one escape. It was easy to see that determination in the obstinate way they locked the place up after the event, or after that event. But they were never able to bring back the ones that got away. No matter how much the staff were mortified, they couldn't reclaim the children and punish them. In other words, if you can make it to the house of love and mercy, you could escape the evil clutches of this hell. On the other hand, the one they caught went through such misery afterwards, yet the exact details of how he was punished were never passed down. All that remained were ominous phrases left by those who knew him at the time. The drowned ducky, the mashed caterpillar, the splayed piggy. I can't even imagine what kind of punishments they were. The only thing I can say is that those punishments were supposed to be far more harsh than the casket punishment, which was the most cruel punishment I knew at the time. I can only imagine how horrible those punishments were from their ominous names. After that, the captured kid's wish came true and he was able to leave the orphanage. Was he able to leave this orphanage safely and enjoy his freedom while breathing in fresh air under the blue sky? Well, according to the rumors, that wasn't what happened at all. While he was playing in the boiler room, he slipped and fell, injured his brain, and died. The children were instructed not to go into the boiler room after that incident. Everyone knew the boiler room was always locked. 
so everyone knew. He was killed. And not just that, he was killed after being tortured. He was killed to teach the other children that they would face hell on earth if they tried to escape. Yet those who faced that risk and made it out obtained ordinary average lives full of love and mercy's namesake, which were far better conditions than, the, than we lived in here. Maybe the house of love and mercy w was really heaven. Maybe all the orphanages are pretty much the same. But compared to my orphanage, I bet anything else would have been better. Even if someone escaped successfully, the police would catch him. Then he'd be sent back to the orphanage, which would be pretty much the same as being killed. However, if he could reach the house of love and mercy, they'd take him in. They wouldn't send him back. By talking about escaping to the house of love and mercy, we were trying to forget how cruel reality was to us. And then one day, the leader of our group, Eriko, said to us quietly, Would you like to try to escape if you had a chance to? Who didn't want to escape from here? It was a rather foolish question, but that wasn't what she meant. If there was a chance to escape, would you take that chance, knowing what you had to go through if you got caught? That was what she meant. Not one of us could answer immediately. If the previous escape incident was a total success, then we might have thought differently. But after that, the orphanage had tightened up security to prevent runaways. All the doors and windows were locked heavily, and it wouldn't be at all easy to get out. Even if another group escape was planned, the success rate would be very low. Three escaped, and one was caught before. Maybe two would be caught next time. No, maybe everyone would be. If I could, I'd want to escape. But the House of Love and Mercy is so far away. The bridge is long too. We'll all be caught before we get there. Besides, we can't even go outside. Everything is locked up. There were locks all over the orphanage. To escape, you need a key for both the inside and the outside. And after the lights were turned off, even each section of the hallway was individually locked. Make no mistake... This was a prison. According to the rumors, orphanages receive government funding depending on the number of children they house. So if anyone escapes, they lose money. Also, if we were to expose the conditions at the orphanage, they would end up being inspected and things would get complicated for them. That was why they were so intent on keeping us locked up. Sure, if there was a chance, I would want to escape. But realistically, there's no way we could. Every door is locked? Well, did you know? The hen house in the courtyard uses the same key as the door to the back stairs. Huh? Really? Shh! Erico shushed us. Sometimes mass produced locks take the same key. Of course, most places use different types of locks so that this won't happen, but the staff at the orphanage must have overlooked it. So there were two locks that used the same key at the orphanage. However, most of us had never had a chance to even touch the keys. But there were a few exceptions. One of those was the hen house. Each room group each room group, excuse me, took turns taking care of different chores. If your group was assigned to clean the hen house, you'd have to get the key t uh, to it from the teacher's office. You were supposed to return the key immediately after you were done. But while taking care of the hen, the hen house, uh, the key was in the children's hands. While the staff would occasionally come around to check, they couldn't keep an eye on us forever. Erika chan you aren't thinking about using that key, are you? Let's not. It's too dangerous. Of course it's too dangerous if there's only one of us. But it's different if we're in a group. Wait, why? Do you know why only one kid was caught the last time they tried to escape? They were desperate. And so, to escape as a group, they did something to increase the chance of success. That was why only one of them was caught. What did they do? They scattered as they ran. They dashed in different directions. They waited until the day when there were only a few people working at the orphanage and ran this way and that. And so, although it all depended on luck, 
it would increase the chance of success for sure. On your own, you'd probably have no hope, but if the staff were to chase after the other children, <coughs> the other children, excuse me, then your own chance of escaping successfully would increase. In other words, Erica was inviting us to escape with her. The more children join, the more each of our chances would increase. But among us, haha, <laughs> there were children who tattled to the staff for their own benefit. So she had to be very careful about who she talked to. Eriko must have trusted us a lot. Eriko, me, Tomomi, and Kikuko? Four children? Do any of you want to stay here a day longer? The three of us shook our heads. But at the same time, we couldn't agree to escape with her either. Of course, we don't want to stay here a day longer, or even an hour longer. Even if we did exactly the same thing as we did yesterday, we might get yelled at tomorrow. I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand living in fear of what to do and what not to do so I won't be yelled at. We all feel the same way. We could endure strict rules, but it was almost impossible to endure vague ones. It wasn't too much of a stretch to say that the rules depended on the mood of the staff. This is okay. That isn't okay. Such borderline rules change daily. And if we were to say anything about that, we would be treated horribly for it. I will escape even if I have to do it alone. Like I said, the more people that join, the better our chance. Think about it. If they find out about this hen house key trick, they are sure to change the lock on the back door. In other words, we only have one chance. So even if you regret not joining in later, it'll be too late. But, uh, I'm scared. I'm scared too. If we get caught, we'll be killed. Tomomi and Kikoko were the, weren't the only ones who felt afraid. The fear was perfectly understandable, because all of a sudden the fear of the punishment that would follow had become very realistic. I'm sure Eriko felt the same way too, but her courage was suppressing her fear, and because of that she shared her idea with us. So do you plan to stay here forever? No, 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 no way. I know you're scared. But this is the only chance we have. You have to be brave just this once. What about you, Miyoko? Don't you want to go don't you want to go with me? Unlike Tomomi and Kikuko, I wasn't trembling that much. Of course I was scared in my own way, but compared to the other two, I must have appeared rather calm. Can we really escape? Of course Eriko couldn't uh, uh, guarantee our success. But I had to ask her anyway. There's no guarantee, but if you join me, I'll have a better chance of escaping than trying to run on my own. Of course, the same goes for you too. Eriko gave me a calculated reason, but I'm sure she just wanted a friend to agree with her. That was probably more important to her than increasing her chances of escape. Tomomi, uh, Kikuko, if you're too scared, then I won't force you. Miyoko and I will escape ourselves. Two is enough. Ah, uh, well... Erika rushed the two to make up their minds. It almost looked cold, but that was her way of mustering their courage. Because it was very possible that, regardless of the outcome of our escape attempt, as our roommates, those two would be held responsible. It's not like we'll do it tomorrow. Our turn to take care of the hen house is in a week. We'll wait for the perfect time to do it. If we don't feel that it's safe, then we'll wait until our next turn. We'll be very careful. The rotation of the staff and the timing were important, but we also each had to know the way to the house of love and mercy. We were planning to split up, so we had to know the area. I made up my mind. Okay, I'm coming with you. But let's time our escape very carefully, okay? Of course. We'll be killed if we get caught. I don't want to die. I'll come too. Me too, me too. Tomomi and Kikuko agreed, and so we all decided to escape as a group. We waited for the perfect opportunity. We waited for the day where only a few staff members were at the orphanage, and we decided to let God take care of the rest. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that's perfect uh that's the perfect way to go about it. Ah, it's open. Maybe it's the way I did it. Eric tried to open the lock several times without success, but I got it to open on the first attempt. The back door opened slowly, 
and we felt a cool breeze. This wasn't the world of freedom just yet. In fact, it was the exact opposite. If the staff were to find out we were here, we would be in big trouble. It was a world of danger. But unless we went through that dangerous world, we wouldn't be able to go any further. Yes. I didn't know they had voices. I think Erika wanted to say that. We were planning to leave with that as our cue. But what we heard instead wasn't Erika's voice. Why are the sound effects so fucking loud? We started to run. It was raining. We all got soaked immediately and our clothes stuck to our skin. While that would normally be very uncomfortable, we couldn't even stop to think about that. We could only keep running in the rain. We were dashing on gravel, but it felt more like trudging uh, through a muddy rice field. My feet kept sinking and I couldn't pull them up. I was frustrated because no matter how fast I tried to run, I wasn't gaining any speed. I felt a sense of urgency. I heard someone yelling escape behind me, and all I could do was run like crazy. Okay, oh, nope, okay, she's speaking, yay. With Eriko's cue, we all went different ways, hoping they wouldn't be coming after us. Okay, even the rain is like really fucking loud. Oh, you know what? Okay, yeah, I did turn down the music. I'm gonna turn down the sound effects too. I don't know if that's gonna do much. It, it literally does nothing with the rain. All right, lovely. Everything's just so loud. Would we be able to reunite safely at the House of Love and Mercy? All four of us there together, or maybe someone would be missing. No, maybe. Everyone else would make it, and I'd be the one who gets caught. My thoughts were interrupted by the voice of a staff member coming from behind me. The staff members should have numbered fewer than us. So if I was lucky, they wouldn't be coming after me. Praying that the staff voices I heard in the distance weren't after me, I looked back for a moment. If I had time to turn around, why didn't I take another step forward? Why didn't I try to escape further? As I turned around, I felt a huge hand cover my face. Its pinky finger slipped into my open mouth. The hand grabbing my face shoved me into the muddy gravel. Of course, I didn't stay quiet. I fought back, and then I saw his face. It was the scariest face I'd ever seen. I realized it immediately. He only wanted to capture me alive to use me an example. And considering what would happen to me afterwards, killing me here on the spot wouldn't pose any problem, would it? Yes, he looked at me with unworldly hate, ready to end my life here and now. His pinky finger ended up touching my tongue. The indescribably nasty taste sent an icky feeling through my whole body. Ah, that's it. This is what my murder tastes like. He was going to try to shove that finger down my windpipe and suffocate me. And so, in order to live, I fought back the only way I could. Alright, they're yelling. Something warm filled my mouth. I felt like swallowing blood after a nosebleed. I spit it from my mouth and ran without turning around, leaving behind the staff member clutching his pinky finger. Did she bite it off? I heard his roars echoing behind me. It wasn't a man that was after me. It was a beast. He had no interest in capturing me. His only goal was to see me dead. My shoes had slipped off. They weren't sneakers, so they came off easily while I was running like mad. My bare feet stuck or struck the gravel over and over. It was painful, but I didn't care, because if I stopped, I knew what would happen to me. Tree branches cut my face and barbed wires scratched my thighs. My feet and toes were bloody from running on gravel. The blood from the staff member's pinky dripped down from my mouth, staining my chin and chest. I was running for my life with scratches and cuts all over my body. If I were to get caught, I would be killed. If my pursuer had any sense, that, then I would be killed after being tortured. But if he didn't, I would be killed on the spot. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to be killed. My lungs and heart were about to explode. 
my mind went blank, or my mind was blank from fear and lack of oxygen. I was about to lose consciousness. I might have given in. If I didn't hear the voice of the staff member coming after me, oh my god. My knees were shaking. My legs wouldn't move properly. I felt like I was going to fall like a puppet with its strings cut. But I couldn't fall. I couldn't fall just yet. Ah. It was too late. My face had hit the gravel. I felt the awful sensation of falling, and immediately after the roar of the bees coming from behind me. I must have hit my thigh against the steering wheel when I jumped. I can feel the throbbing pain, delayed slightly. I'm sweating all over. I wipe the sweat off my forehead and put my hand on my chest, only then realizing how fast my heart was beating. I rub my thigh. I rubbed it in a straight line. That's not where I hit the steering wheel, but I feel like this is where it hurts. I can't see a scary beast in the moonlit car. I have my shoes on and I'm not covered in blood. My toes are fine too. Someone knocked on the window, startling me. Sansa, time is time. Thank you. I wanted to take a nap, so I told him to come wake me up in an hour. Maybe an hour was too long. Too long a nap actually makes you tired. That's true. That is true. I put my seat back up and got out of the car. The cool breeze feels good on my skin. I only see the moon. There's nothing else to see on this mountain trail. My car and a command vehicle disguised as a trailer are parked on the side of the street. I can still feel that bad taste in my mouth. I spat it out on the side of the street. But even that couldn't get rid of it. The taste of blood, saliva, and rain. Sweat from my forehead and raindrops got into my mouth and I couldn't swallow. So I ended up drooling. That sensation around my lips brought back memories, and I tried to wipe my mouth. Maybe I'm nervous. Oh yeah, the music is... Oh yeah, this, this track is definitely louder. Yeah, the whole music or sound mixing in this game is much different. I'm... I don't know why, but... Uh, I'm gonna have to mess around with it. Like, right now, I might... Yeah, that... Yeah, that, that sounds a little bit better. Maybe. I don't know anymore. We'll set it right here. Sound effects will have, like, a little louder, maybe. Uh, man, I don't know. Yeah, the sound mixing is just, like, it is not right. Yeah, like, the little clicks here, like, they sound quiet now. I don't know. I'm gonna have to fuck around with it. It's, it's not gonna be consistent, and it's gonna bug the shit out of me, but oh well. Maybe I'm nervous, and that's why I had such a bad dream. I think there's a coffee machine in the command vehicle. An unpleasant cup of coffee will make me or will wake me up, especially if it's unpleasant. I still have a bad taste in my mouth. The feeling of biting and crushing his little finger and his and his filthy blood filling my mouth. I'm sure a sweeter cup of coffee will wash down that bad taste and also wake me up from my nightmare completely. Alright. Well, we got started here with uh, Chapter 8 on quite a wild note. If you thought that uh, Shion's escape was wild and crazy, I'd say this really takes the cake. The House of Love and Mercy was the achievement here. We'll view our tip. There is no tip to view. Never mind. Uh, so I guess we'll uh, we'll save it here. We'll get into the next uh, bit here. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to fuck around with the, uh, with the audio a bit. And figure out what I want to do. I mean, 
to be completely honest with you, Higurashi has always had like really scuffed voice audio. Like, I, I don't know why. I think it's just how they did their recording sessions or something. And then the mixing and everything, the quality of some of the sounds or of the voices sound worse at times randomly, louder, quieter. It's always been a mess, but I try to have consistency and sometimes it just do not work. So I'll fuck around with it as we continue along. I hope you uh, don't mind. It's probably not even like that much of a difference. Like I'm only noticing a few extra decibels added kind of where the voices were sitting in the previous chapters. So it's not even it's not even yet reaching that consistently. I'm going to I'm going to have to experiment. We'll we'll kind of see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, wow, that was a, uh, a lot to take in for episode one here. Uh, I forgot to mention in the start, I am going to try and get this all finished up in two months time. I'm sure I can do that. I don't know how long it took me to do the last chapter, but I'm not recording too many things concurrently. So I, just, I think I can get this done reasonably quick if I put all my effort into it. But then again, episode links will vary. They are never consistent, just like the audio in the series. It is what it is, right? But uh, yeah, let's let's talk about this episode. So obviously we're following Takano's past. She seemed to have changed her name at some point. We haven't gotten to that point yet. But we got a quick idea as to her whole god complex that she has going on. A reasonably quick prediction that we can pull up from literally what she and her grandfather were talking about. I don't even think that is her grandfather. I believe that she actually goes through a complete name change. So there's still a lot to learn about Takano here, but I think learning about our antagonist is always a good thing. If there's humanity in our antagonist, then it makes you, it makes you feel something for them it, it builds them up as an actual character rather than just a tool against the protagonist or protagonists or main characters or whatever i think that's really good storytelling if they're able to do that so hopefully this isn't just wasted time and that what we're learning out of takano will serve for some great storytelling as we continue along and hopefully i figure out the audio situation here we'll have to see how that all goes but thank you all for watching if you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, all that fancy jazz. I guess maybe next time we'll get even more of Takano's past, see what happens post-orphanage, if she really did escape or whatever. Goddamn. Uh, I, I'm kind of sad that there weren't any CGs here. That, that would have been pretty badass, but oh well. Maybe next time, and I'll see you guys then. Take it easy.